Ikos Ayas, once a Syriac monastery, is still inhabited today. It contains a typical example of a cave church. The cave seems to offer a protective embrace and, in some places, is incorporated into the building itself. A few other active monasteries can still be found in this part of northern Lebanon known as the Mountain of the Primitive City and today called Wadi Kadisha or the Sacred Valley. There are three dioceses of the Syrian Orthodox Church in Lebanon. The Diocese of Beirut, the Diocese of Mount Lebanon, and the Diocese of Zahle. Together with believers from different countries, the faithful who live here often visit the Holy Valley, following in the footsteps of the countless pilgrims who have passed through here over the centuries on their way to the Holy Land. One of the most popular destinations is still the monastery of Ikos Ayas and its original place of worship dedicated to St. Anthony, who was considered a specialist in healing mental illnesses. Curiosity brings many tourists here to see where the mentally ill were healed long ago, and the high caves where the most dangerous cases were held in chains. But most visitors come here to express their faith. Entire families will light a votive candle and pray together, to give thanks for answered prayers or to ask for grace, to pray for the health of a family member or for the success of a project. Barren women pray for children and unmarried women pray for a husband. Examples of simple devotion that always demand respect. From Lebanon's Bekaa Valley, it's not difficult to reach Ferzol Mountain, with its rock face punctuated by six levels of pre-Christian cave tombs that were taken over centuries later by Syriac monks and transformed into dwellings. Evidence of a pagan past is everywhere, in symbols of Phoenician divinities, and in cells where bloody sacrifices were offered. Visitors can almost identify with the spirits of those who, for love of Christ, chose to live as recluses in these tombs. Dominating the upper reaches of the Orontes River in the Beka Valley is the Cave of the Monk. Originally a monastery, this group of caves was used by crusaders as a fortified lookout point. The vaulted ceiling is darkened a smoky black by torches and fires kept constantly alight to protect the cave's inhabitants from the merciless cold of the long Lebanese winter. Those who make the climb up here are rewarded by the simple signs of devotion that refer not to the Crusades but rather to men, 
whose eyes looked heavenward, men who chose to live in these austere caves during their earthly lives. Below are the springs that give life to the Orontes River. In Aramaic, the Orontes is called Alazi, the Rebel River, because an optical illusion often gives the curious impression that it flows uphill. The river flows in a wide arc through three countries, Lebanon, Syria, and Turkey. Ever since ancient times, it's been harnessed to power water wheels and still serves irrigation canals that turn arid, unfertile land into rich soil. The Orontes River divides in two Antioch, the city of the evangelist Luke and of the first Christians, and after a total course of some 390 kilometers, it empties itself into the Mediterranean. The waters of the Orontes symbolize the vital lifeline that runs from closed monasteries, hermit dwellings, and holy springs through tortuous, mysterious canals to reach the entire community of believers.
Jubad Din, a Muslim village tucked away in the mountains of Kalamun to the north of Damascus. Everything here is similar to innumerable other Muslim villages. The architecture, the way people dress, the way they live. But there is one fundamental difference. Arabic is not spoken here. The people speak Aramaic, or rather, a dialect of Aramaic related to Syriac. Indeed, the inhabitants of this Syrian village are direct descendants of those Aramean peoples who, many centuries before Christ, inhabited Upper Mesopotamia and then moved south to lay their roots throughout the Middle East, from Turkey to Iraq, to Syria to Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. Islam is the faith of these people who hold in honor Abraham, the wandering Aramean, as the Bible calls him, the great prophet, the friend of God, and their direct ancestor. And they guard their Aramaic dialect jealously. Over 3,000 years ago, their ancestors used the same language. It is a source of wonderment to hear people chatting about everyday matters in this age-old language that has been passed down orally from one generation to the next for over three millennia. Right now, the subject of discussion is an upcoming feast day. The final word, as always, will be spoken by the Mukhtar, the village chief. The songs are in Aramaic. Even modern songs are translated from Arabic into the ancient language that parents teach their children, who in turn will teach their children and grandchildren. Ma'alula, another small town to the north of Damascus, where Aramaic is also spoken. The name has Aramaic roots. Ma'alula means entry. This time, the inhabitants are mainly Christian.
Malula and its surrounding area is in one of the oldest inhabited parts of the Middle East. Stone Age man lived here some 50 to 60,000 years ago. The area is strewn with caves once used as sites of worship or burial, or, when necessary, for defensive purposes. The way they're laid out would allow a handful of men to resist the attack of an army. One example is the inaccessible cave known as the Fortress. Another enormous cave, called the Castle, could hold up to 1,200 people. One of these caves, originally a place of burial, houses traces of the first Christian settlements dating back to before Ma'alula was developed outside the caves. A cross and a bird, possibly a pelican, the symbol of Jesus. A vandalized carving of the Virgin and Child. A peacock that symbolizes immortality. A Greek inscription that refers to Christ's victory over the pagans and a symbol of the Trinity. Apart from the name, additional evidence of the growth of the Aramean community in Malula can be found in local traditions and in the day-to-day -day conversation of its current inhabitants. <laughs> In the course of the centuries, the Aramaic language was divided into various dialects, Nabataean, Palmyrene, Mandean and Syriac, in addition to the dialect spoken in Jubaddin and Ma'alula in the Kalamun Mountains. In the highest part of the village is a typical Malula house. It's the home of a 105-year-old woman, a shrine for the memories, emotions, and illusions that have filled her long life. She talks about them in Aramaic, the only language she knows, and one of the few things that have never changed for her. After the Emperor Constantine's Edict of Milan in 313 AD, communities like Malula emerged from the safety of the caves and gained importance as centers of Christianity. Indeed, some Christians felt encouraged to destroy pagan temples or transform them into churches. The Monastery of St. Sergius above Malula is an extraordinary example of this kind of transformation. The doorway is so low that non-Christians and Christians alike are obliged to bow to enter what is considered to be one of the oldest churches, not only in Syria, but in the entire world. The Lord's Prayer, recited in Aramaic by this girl, is a familiar sound for these ancient stones and the centuries-old woodwork. Probably built around the year 325, the year of the Nicene Council, 
the church is a visual representation of the transition from ancient paganism to the Christian revolution. That transition is physically embodied in some of the wooden beams that scientific tests have shown are over 2,000 years old. And by a pagan altar with a hole through which sacrificial blood would drip to be collected in jars. This means that parts of the building date back to before Christ. For some people, the use of pagan elements in a Christian church might be considered sacrilegious. But to believers free of prejudice, it's a sign of the deep change that occurred in the hearts of men with the advent of Christ. Legend tells of a Christian girl called Tekla, whose father, a pagan and perhaps a king, wanted to marry her off to a pagan officer. While trying to escape from her father's soldiers, Tekla found her path blocked by a high rock face. The girl prayed to the Lord to give her an escape route. Suddenly, the rock face split open to reveal a passage that became known as St. Tekla's Gorge. The gorge became the girl's home, and after her martyrdom, St. Tekla was buried here. Every day, pilgrims from all over Syria and from other countries visit the monastery sanctuary of St. Tekla in Malula that houses the saint's tomb and relics. Saidnaya is another Syrian town that, before the arrival of the Greeks and Arabs, was inhabited only by people of Aramean descent. The Aramaic heritage is reflected by the town's ancient name, Danuba. Like Malula, evidence of prehistoric Saidnaya lies in caves where pre-Stone Age objects have been discovered. The town's recorded history began in the indestructible monuments erected by the Greeks during their 400-year occupation. The Christian tradition is evident in the many local churches and monasteries, the most important of which is dedicated to Our Lady of Saidnaya. Built 1,500 years ago, it was known as the Fort due to its impregnable defensive position. This monastery sanctuary is visited daily by tourists and pilgrims of different faiths, including Muslims. The monastery and sanctuary are looked after by nuns of the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch, to whom Christians of the Byzantine Church who speak Arabic answer. The nuns are also responsible for restoring antique icons and safeguarding a veritable treasure trove of ancient manuscripts. Although these are now in Arabic, in the Middle Ages, Saidnaya was an important center for the copying of Syriac manuscripts. These are only some of the books from the monastery's original library. Many more have been burned, stolen, or destroyed by the ravages of time. In the reliquary, the icon of the Blessed Virgin, called Shagura in Aramaic, meaning the famous one, is surrounded by an incredible collection of ex voto offerings that reflect the gratitude of countless beneficiaries who come from many different countries and many different sectors of Christianity. The root 
roots of this Christian eclecticism can be found in the life of St. Simeon Stylites. Simeon was born in Cilicia in 390 and later moved to Syria. After subjecting himself to intense acts of contrition and mortification, he moved to a mountain near Aleppo. Here, he built a column on which he lived and preached ceaselessly to ever-growing crowds of people who flocked to him in hope of his blessing or to be healed. The name Stylite, from Greek stulos meaning column, was given to his followers who became known as Stylites. The base of his famous column is still visible today in the monumental remains of the church named after him at Kalatsiman, or the citadel of Saint Simeon. The column was 36 cubits, or 15 meters high, and from its summit, the saint healed, solved disputes, and preached social justice until his dying day. Historian Theodoret, Simeon's contemporary, wrote that pilgrims to the saint's column came from many different countries, Ismaelites, Persians, Armenians, Georgians, Himyarites from southern Arabia, as well as Spaniards, Britons, and Gauls. The existence of different faiths was not important to the saint. To him, all that mattered was God. Keep your own faith, he used to say. Just leave me my God. That's why at Kalatsiman, we often find the Syriac cross alongside Greek, Byzantine, Latin, and Maltese crosses. These symbols of different Christian traditions are a concrete indication of St. Simeon's eclecticism. Dotting the countryside around Kalatsiman are the remains of nearly a thousand villages and towns that prospered between the first and seventh centuries AD and then fell prey to a series of economic crises, wars, invasions, and natural disasters. These are the famous dead cities of Syria's northern limestone hills. Here, even place names conjure up pictures of utter desolation. This valley is called the Valley of the Wind's Door. There is evidence of burgeoning spirituality everywhere, particularly in the remains of imposing churches. Along with financial prosperity, the inhabitants once enjoyed a rich religious life founded on their Christian faith. But now, all that is history. A walk through the ruins and rubble of what were once architectural jewels and centers of Christian spirituality is a sobering experience. Among countless examples of the extreme degradation is the baptismal font of the Church of Mushabak, today used as a watering trough for sheep. The once magnificent Byzantine church of Kalb Lause, that means almond heart, is another example of past splendor. Fortunately, in modern Syria, the idea of persecution or even religious discrimination is absolutely foreign. Perhaps one day, this extraordinary Christian heritage will be safeguarded in the measure that it deserves. It's a priceless treasure for Syria, as well as for the rest of the world.
At Al-Ruzafa are the ruins of the Church of St. Sergis. The Bedouin tribes of Syria, many of which were Christian, were particularly devoted to St. Sergis and often visited his sanctuary in Rusafa. Here too, there is evidence of the ancient Syriac liturgical rite, for example in the characteristic bima, the dais in old Syriac churches from which the priest read the holy books. The Aramean heritage of the Syrian Orthodox Christians is also rich in traditions tied to the liturgical calendar. These are celebrated with great enthusiasm and much ceremony and include a contest held on Palm Sunday during which people try to touch the holy palms carried in procession by the bishop. And the washing of the feet ceremony on Holy Thursday that takes place here at the archaeological site of Kalat Simam. Sadat is a small town in central Syria. In the solitude of the Church of St. George, a group of girls practices an Aramaic song, the most beautiful and simple of prayers taught by Jesus, the Lord's Prayer. There's an underlying element of melancholy in this simple religious melody, as in all the songs and melodies belonging to the Syriac Christian musical tradition that expresses so well the endless suffering and hardship that this oppressed people has had to bear. The walls of this church, like the walls of the churches of St. Sergius and Bacchus in the same town, are decorated with ancient frescoes depicting scenes and people related to the Christian tradition and to the Syrian Orthodox Church in particular. The simplicity of the images is immensely moving. A description of each figure and each scene is given in elegant Syriac writing. A large number of ancient manuscripts and holy books written in Syriac is preserved here. Deplorably, the congregation treats with great familiarity priceless books that warrant a greater sense of preservation. Kamishli in Syria is a border town created by the Syrian Orthodox Christians who had fled from nearby Turkey in the face of persecutions that destroyed their villages, burned their fields, and transformed their churches into mosques. Just beyond the national border is Turabdin, which means Mountain of the Servants of God. 4,000 years ago, along with northern Syria and Iraq, this region was the cradle of the ancient Aramean civilization. After the coming of Christ, it became the land of the Syrian Orthodox Christians. Nowadays, that presence has been largely lost in the annals of time.
Kafro, Bazibrin. Until the beginning of the 20th century, these were prosperous Christian villages. Now, they're ghost towns surrounded by abandoned fields. Fanatical persecution by the Kurdish people, influenced by short-sighted governments to carry out an insane policy of religious cleansing, has reduced arable land around the Christian communities of Tur Abdin to wasteland. Fortunately, today the Republic of Turkey has distanced itself from the Ottoman policy of yesteryear. The last Christian family to live here in the village of Urnus, now called Baglabasi, was massacred in 1992 by Muslim Kurds who had been promised their victims money and land in return. The 5th century church of St. Kyriakos is locked up. A Muslim woman keeps the key. village of Salah is the small 5th century monastery of St. Jacob, staffed by three monks and two nuns. Today, there are only two lay members in the Christian community that used to flourish around the tomb of the saint. We can't help but compare the decline of the Christian presence with the ruins not far from the monastery of the Persian Temple of Heracles that date back long before the coming of Christ. of the 8th century San Sobo in Ha is the Church of the Virgin Mary, whose origins go back to the early centuries of Christianity. Local traditions hold that the three wise men stopped here on their way to Bethlehem. Once a prosperous and bustling center of activity, it is now little more than a vantage point in what was formerly a Christian land. Einvardo was founded, like most places in the area, before the coming of Christ. 100 years ago, it was an entirely Christian community. Today, the inhabitants are nearly all Muslim. Only eight Christian families remain. According to local tradition, this once wealthy town with several churches was saved by St. George at the time of the massacres of 1915, which decimated the Christians living on the high plateau of Turabdin. Many of the village's inhabitants are said to have seen the saint with their own eyes as he charged the aggressors on his horse, lance in hand. It's sad to note that until only a few years ago, local oppression and murderous fanaticism against the Christian community were still the order of the day. But while the memory of those tragic circumstances is still vivid, a ray of hope appears. A few Christians have decided to remain here, stubbornly eking out a precarious living in the firm belief that centuries of violence and murder belong definitively in the past.
They are convinced that this mountain of the servants of God will soon, once again, be a flourishing seat of Christianity. They contribute to this dream by sending their children every day to the monastery to learn the language of their ancestors. Three monks, two nuns, and their young pupils are the congregation of the 4th century monastery of Mor Melke, another outpost along the symbolic Christian defense line in the Turabdin Mountains. <laughs> Working the fields and tending the few domestic animals takes up much of the time of those who live in the surviving Syrian Orthodox monasteries. Like the inhabitants of any besieged fortress, they must be completely self-sufficient when it comes to the essentials, and their commitment itself becomes a form of prayer and dedication to the Lord. How many young martyrs have died here? But today, perhaps more than anywhere else, these children offer hope for tomorrow. Arkah is another semi-abandoned village in the Turabdin Hills. State-appointed teachers don't come here. This is Kurdish country, and people are afraid. This teacher is a volunteer sent by the bishop. Perhaps he too is afraid, but he has a mission to accomplish. The children are learning their language. They know that when they grow up, their mission will be to pass it on to future generations. The parish priest insists we join him for lunch at his home. His eldest daughter prepares typical local dishes and in our honor, the village Mukhtar joins the party. Among the pictures on the walls is a portrait of Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey, perhaps a tribute to the man who was the first Turkish leader to advocate the separation of political power from any form of religious fundamentalism, thus indirectly helping the Christian cause. The parish priest of Keferze also invited us to his house. 
Another sign of hope for the future is that 15 Christian families and 15 Kurdish families live peacefully side by side in his village. This is why he sometimes has visitors with whom he speaks in Kurdish. Among the photographs and pictures on the walls is a portrait of a young bishop, the current patriarchal vicar of the Syrian Orthodox Diocese in Germany. He was born in this village and was baptized by the same priest who offers us tea. The church, dedicated to St. Ozozoel, dates back to the 5th century. As always, the congregation is made up almost exclusively of women, children, and elderly people. There is little to keep young people here, and inevitably, they can't wait to move away. There are still a few villages where the original ethnic identity is intact. In Bekuzione, now Bakizyan, the 120 to 130 inhabitants divided among 14 families are all Christians. 100 years ago, this was the norm in Turabdin. Today, it's a rarity. The village prepares for a celebration. In every house, women are busy cooking traditional dishes. Bread is made according to a centuries-old recipe using wheat flour ground with a mill that probably looks much the same as those used in Noah's time. The cross marked on the dough before it's placed in the oven is a sign of thanks to God for having provided the food, as well as a symbol of propitiation that he will continue to do so in the future. Easter eggs are decorated according to an age-old ritual. Fingers caress the fragile shells with traditional expertise. The eve of this celebration is no different to the eve of such celebrations anywhere else in the world. Unmarried women prepare to look their most attractive just in case there's a future husband at the party. The older women give advice and offer alternative solutions. In this age of discotheques, drugs, and extreme forms of entertainment, in which the so-called advanced societies celebrate consumerism and the satisfaction of every human whim on the collective altar, a party like this serves as a reminder that, in the words of Jesus, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven.
Despite improved conditions for Christians in Turabdin, their survival has not received the all clear. Danger may still lurk in the embers of fanaticism that constantly smolder in this region. The Syrian Orthodox Church is the institution that champions the cause of the Aramean population, and it does what it can. The role of protector and guardian is delegated to the parishes and to the few remaining monasteries, the real strongholds of Turabdin's Christian fabric. Ruins of monasteries that were active up until the turn of the 19th century are commonplace. Among the still functioning monasteries are two that are especially important. Deir ad Zafaran, the Safran Monastery, lies southeast of Mardin, the largest city in this Turkish province. The name comes from the color of the local stone. Built in 493 AD, Deir ad Zafaran was considered the citadel of the Aramean Christians of Turabdin. For almost 800 years, from 1160 to 1920, it was the seat of the Syrian Orthodox Patriarchate that is now located in Damascus. Today, only two monks live here. With the help of a handful of lay volunteers, they run a school for orphans and tend to the religious needs of the local congregation. Our guide explains that more than 2,000 years ago, the oldest wing of the monastery was a temple to the sun god. Before BC 2000 years ago, and this is a window. The sun raising. There was a window here, facing east, before which pagans would gather to worship the rising sun. And this part is for sacrifice, and people they give. In the sacrificial area, animals were offered to the sun god. More important than seeming. These stone slabs are fitted together without the use of mortar or metal braces. They're approximately two meters high and simply fitted next to one another in six rows to the left and six rows to the right of a central row of keystones. They hold each other like that. These doors are 300 years old. The doors of the crypt that houses the tombs of the patriarchs are 300 years old. The church with all its stucco work, ornamentation, furniture and altars is the work of Aramean craftsmen. The Patriarch's throne used to be in Antioch. On the back, starting from the middle, are the names of all the Patriarchs that have succeeded each other through the centuries, from St. Peter to the present day. Three hundred years ago, these litters were used to take the Patriarchs on long pastoral journeys along the rough, often hostile roads of Turabdin. 
The altar of the Virgin Mary is a masterpiece of Aramean craftsmanship. It's entirely made of walnut wood, joined without nails or metal braces. At the foot of the altar is a fragment of the mosaic from the cave of St. Peter in Antioch that dates back 1,600 years. The time has come to say goodbye, but first, our host has something to show us before we leave. Look down in Syria, Damascus, Patriarch, and those were monasteries. Moriaco, Virgin Mary, destroyed by the enemies of our faith because religion hatred. It's late. We have to get going if we want to arrive to Mor Gabriel before it's dark. All oh, right, because when we'll come down, Mor Gabriel, doors closed. Right. Southeast of Midyat. The monastery of Mor Gabriel is the geographical and spiritual heart of the plateau and the safest place of refuge in the entire region. Founded in 397 AD, it's not only the oldest surviving Syrian Orthodox monastery in Turkey, but also the most active one. just in time. Every evening at sunset, the great iron doors are closed and will only be open again the following morning. Among the many activities here, the most important is the school. The monastery of Mor Gabriel is truly a bastion of Syriac tradition. Today, the walls, which in the course of the centuries have repelled armies and predators alike, serve to discourage those who would like to eliminate the very notion of Christianity in this region. The monastery of Mor Gabriel is the seat of the Archbishop Vicar of Turabdin, who has the heavy responsibility of keeping Syrian Orthodox Christianity alive in the land of its birth, and, when necessary, of offering the faithful a refuge in the monastery itself. But where is everybody? Oh yes, of course, today is Sunday. has recently been restored, a long but rewarding job carried out with scrupulous regard for the original architecture. 
This is especially true of the church that for years was used as a stable by Muslim hordes who showed no respect for the tombs of over 12,000 slain Christians. few tombs, some mosaics, and the chapel of Mor Gabriel, the founder of the monastery, are all that survive of the original church. Renovation of the chapel included the narrow passageway through which the saint entered and left his cell to join his brothers or to pray in the chapel. We bade farewell to the tranquility of Mor Gabriel and set out on the long journey to Iraq, the third country that, along with Syria and Turkey, made up the Aramaeans' homeland. After overcoming a few unexpected bureaucratic problems, we arrived at the Marmatai Monastery in the region of Mosul. Renovation work is in full swing. Workers go about their business as we visit the chapel that houses the tombs of Marmatai and other saints. Among them is Gregorius Barebroio, who lived in the 13th century and is the most famous of all Syriac writers. Mar Banam is one of Iraq's most impressive monasteries. It was built on the site where, in around 382 AD, Prince Banam was murdered with his sister Sarah and 40 other Christians by order of his father, Sennacherib, Lord of Nimrod, who would not tolerate his children's conversion to the religion of Christ. The building is considered the finest medieval Christian monument in Iraq. The church was built in the 12th or 13th century and has two magnificent base reliefs, one of Mar Banam on horseback triumphing over the devil, the other of Saint Sarah being baptized. Copies have been incorporated into the facade in place of the vandalized originals. Behind the monastery, on the actual site of the massacre, is a mausoleum that houses the remains of the two saints and the faithful who died with them while praying for the forgiveness of their persecutors.
In the Iraqi villages inhabited by Syriac Christians, many churches have been destroyed by the ravages of time. But as in Bartolo, near Mosul, many new places of worship and community activity have been built in recent years. The church of Mar Shmuni boasts a font that dates back to 1343. In Jerusalem, as we look over the rooftops and terraces on the slopes of the Hill of Zion, our attention is drawn to the little bell tower of St. Mark's Monastery. The monastery can only be reached on foot after threading one's way through the maze of tiny streets and alleys of the Tower of David area. It was built on the ancient site of the evangelist's home, an inscription in medieval Syriac discovered in 1940 to the left of the main entrance to the monastery's church testifies to this. It reads, this is the house of Mary, mother of John called Mark, proclaimed Church of the Holy Apostles and named after the Virgin Mary, mother of God, following the ascension to heaven of our Lord Jesus Christ, restored after the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus in the year of the Lord 73. After the Syrian Orthodox Church lost its other churches and properties here in the Holy City, the monastery became, and still is, the Archbishop's seat and center of Jerusalem's Syriac community. Tradition holds that this painting on leather of the Virgin and Child, of which a number of copies can be seen in many famous sanctuaries, is in fact a true portrait of Christ's mother, painted by Saint Luke. Syrian Orthodox Christians are also present in Bethlehem. This Syriac church stands beside the spot where tradition has it that the three wise men rested while following the star. Tradition also declares that it stands on the very site of the inn where Joseph and Mary failed to find room. Given Mary's impending labor, they were forced to take shelter in the grotto, which has now been incorporated into the nearby Basilica of the Nativity. The only way to reach the monastery of Mar Musa, or St. Moses the Ethiopian, is on foot. Those who make it this far are received with open arms regardless of their faith. People come here to spend a day, months, or even years in meditation, study, and prayer. wonder that the small resident community, a fine example of fraternal heterogeneity, is in a state of constant flux. An important Syrian Orthodox monastery for centuries, in the 19th century, Mar Musa changed hands and eventually fell into ruin. 
Now, run by the Italian Jesuit who is the power behind the renovation work, it's become a place of ecumenical hospitality to enhance the mutual understanding that embraces all Christians, no matter which confession they belong to, and to extend it to include Muslims and followers of other religions. Tradition says that the monastery was founded by an Ethiopian who traveled through Egypt and Palestine and settled in Syria, where he lived as a hermit and died a martyr. Marmousa's position makes it an impregnable fortress, but appearances can be deceiving. It's open to all people of goodwill who can make the long and arduous 800 meter climb. In the end, we had to use the community's special transportation for our camera equipment. The terrain around the monastery is barren and inhospitable, traversed by tracks that are as difficult as the proverbial path to heaven. Only four-footed climbers negotiate them with dexterity and arrogant indifference. Newly arrived guests are given the grand tour by the community's young priest. Down below, the desert stretches eastwards as far as the eye can see. Among the many interesting sites are the caves where the monks once lived. Rain collected in large cisterns was their only source of water. Some of the caves have been converted into cells to host guests. Recently, the number of visitors has been growing steadily, and the construction of additional guest quarters is already underway. The monastery dates from the 4th century, but it took on its current shape in the 15th century, when it became an important Syrian Orthodox synobium. In 1982, it was in a seemingly irreversible state of ruin. Rebuilding has been a long and difficult task financed by a school of restorers through a cooperative venture of Italian professors and local students. Most of the medieval frescoes have been saved and it's hoped that even more will be recovered in the future. Among the frescoes, a large last judgment occupies the entire west wall. Precious manuscripts, part of the heritage of the Syriac Christians, have also been saved and restored, as well as Arabic inscriptions in a Syriac context. Fine examples of the Arabization of the Aramean Christians in the 11th century, and of a profound and wholehearted Christian participation in Arab culture. In fact, small groups of Arab pre-Islamic Christians, the result of 14 centuries of side-by-side -side coexistence, are still today Christians within a church based on the Syriac culture. Thus, the renovated monastery now safeguards a historic, cultural, and spiritual heritage within the greater scheme of Christianity as a whole. Kera means coconut, and Kerala means land of coconuts. At the southernmost point of India, the Aramaic heritage of the Syrian Orthodox Church dates back to the time when Thomas the Apostle landed here to spread the gospel message.
It is a cultural and religious, not ethnic, heritage that has been passed down through the Church of Malankara, the Syrian Orthodox Church of Kerala, that recognizes the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch as its figurehead. In the monastery of Malekrus, near Cochin, we had our first meeting with four resident monks who live there with a few young students. Three monks, including the abbot, were educated in the seminary. The fourth is an ex-clerk of the Indian post office who, at the age of 40, felt the call of the Lord. He answered by giving up all his worldly goods and joining the monastery where he has been living for over 20 years. May you show mercy and blessings on this food, blessed in the name of the Holy Trinity, in the centuries of centuries. Amen. Listening to this grace said by a humble monk in the language that the biblical patriarchs used 4,000 years ago in their prayers to God, and that Jesus of Nazareth used 2,000 years ago is a moving experience. It's an invisible link that brings different places and moments in history together into a single religion. Emphasized by the discovery on distant shores of the living memory of the Aramaeans, a people that was born pagan and became a people of God. At the dawn of Christianity, in the fourth year after the ascension of Christ, 
Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, founded the first Christian church here in Antioch, modern-day Antakya. The first patriarchal seat of the Syrian Orthodox Church, directly descended from Peter's church, was therefore also in Antioch, where it remained until the year 518. The seat of the church was then moved to various monasteries of Mesopotamia. The last was Dera Zafiran, which remained the official seat of the Patriarchate for nearly 700 years, from 1293 until 1932. After a period of atrocious violence, particularly during and following World War I, in which 250,000 faithful lost their lives, the Patriarchate was transferred to various places in Syria. Since 1957, it has been in Damascus. Today, the spiritual head of the Syrian Orthodox Church continues to carry out his high apostolic mission from the capital of Syria, near the gate of Babtuma, one of the seven gates in the ancient walls of Damascus is the seat of the Patriarchate. The current Patriarch, His Holiness Moran Mor Ignatius Zaka I, is 122nd in a line that starts with St. Peter. A half hour drive north of Damascus is the great seminary of St. Ephraim, whose impressive buildings were officially opened in 1966. Although the style is modern, this and other recent church buildings often contain elements inspired by traditional Syriac architecture and style. One example of this is the new monastery of St. Mary near Hasake in eastern Syria. It has only recently been finished. A spontaneous act of reverence by a passing van driver honored the sanctity of this new monastery that was still not inaugurated at the time. The language of the Syrian Orthodox Church is Syriac. Along with Palmyrene, Nabataean, Mandaic, and the Jewish Aramaic dialects, Syriac is the legacy of Aramaic, the language of Jesus and the Apostles. A legacy that is cherished in these manuscripts of the past, some of which have had a hazardous and troubled history. So much so, that it's a sheer miracle that a part of these, some of them 15 centuries old, have reached our own times. In 1559, a large number of Syriac manuscripts were burned in India in the presence of the members of the Jamper Synod, a move that aimed to stamp out many of the local Syriac Christian traditions. 10,000 Middle Eastern manuscripts were lost in 1715 when the ship that was carrying them to the Vatican sank. Perhaps these are among the reasons why in the Syrian Orthodox Church of today, patient hands continue to copy these precious writings. The painstaking labor of a scribe from ages past. It took more than 340 hours to copy the Peshitta, the Syriac text of the Bible. A veritable labor of love.
Here in the cave church of St. Peter in Antioch, the final liturgical ceremony of a synod of Syrian Orthodox bishops is being held. The synod is attended by the patriarch and the archbishops and metropolitans of the 27 dioceses into which the church is divided. In turn, the dioceses gather together some five million faithful scattered throughout the Middle East, India and the rest of the world as a result of the diaspora that has taken place due above all to the need to escape from fanaticism and oppression in several of the home countries. solemn ceremony is over. The patriarch and the bishops receive the respects of Christians who have come from all over the world to attend this rare event. Visitors include a group that perform folk dances from the host country. to the mid-20th century, thousands of Syrian Orthodox Christians emigrated to North and South America, Europe, and to Australia. An all-too-brief visit to some of the communities of the diaspora takes us to the United States of America, to New York, New Jersey, California, in particular, Los Angeles and Portland, Oregon. These are the cities and states that host substantial centers of Syrian Orthodox Christians. Although well integrated into local society, they are proud of their origins and traditions and fiercely committed to preserving their language, celebrating their rituals, and organizing gatherings in order to safeguard the common bond represented by their faith. And the most vulnerable of all their possessions, their identity.
would be a mockery if, after escaping near annihilation in its countries of origin, this people were to succumb to the different customs of their host countries and a higher standard of living that could dull or even wipe out altogether an age-old cultural identity. The Syrian Orthodox Church and its lay associations work hard to make sure that will never happen. The religious communities are subordinate, through their bishops, to the authority of the patriarch, but the lay communities are independently organized and sponsor meetings and rallies born of individual and collective initiatives. Syriac cultural associations and lay communities are grouped into federations, which in turn belong to an organization that unites and represents them all, the SUA, the Syriac Universal Alliance. The SUA was established on July 16, 1963, in New Jersey by the Syrian National Federation in Sweden and the American Aramean Associations. The founders' goals were to have an international organization able to protect the rights of Syrian Aramean individuals and the Syrian Aramean community all over the world, to preserve the language and Aramean traditions and heritage, and to instill in Syrian Arameans the consciousness of their identity and roots, as well as to ensure their freedom and equality on a par with other peoples and nations. In Los Angeles, the Diocese of St. Ephraim, along with the parish of St. George and other parishes, is the driving force behind various social, cultural, and religious programs. Portland, Oregon. The Church of St. Ignatius in the Northern Archdiocese hosted Convention 2000, which brought together the guest of honor, the Archbishop of the Holy Land and Jordan, the Archbishops and highest members of the American clergy, numerous faithful, and the Patriarch who presided over the convention. The program called for a series of educational, cultural, and social events. The theme of the convention was a phrase from St. Paul's letters to the Hebrews in which he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The convention featured many speakers, debates, concerts, and the closing celebration of the divine liturgy by the patriarch. A lively open-air lunch with a menu of traditional dishes from the mother countries helped to consolidate the feeling of fraternity and cordiality that embraced everyone present, clergy and lay members alike. A boat trip on the Columbia River, during which the patriarch, the bishops, and the faithful enjoyed themselves together like old friends, 
provided a fitting finale for the Portland Convention 2000. Montreal, Canada. Monuments, quaint neighborhoods, flashy storefronts, bustling tourist spots, and the many other attractions in this cosmopolitan city would seem to make it an unlikely place to find traces of the Syrian Orthodox religion. Nevertheless, not far from Notre Dame Cathedral, there is more than one Syriac church here. On this site, the diocese's new community center will soon be built. The community holds a meeting to discuss how to get the most out of the new complex that will include a church and various social and recreational facilities. Most of the Syriac Christians in this community come from Lebanon, and many of them are in the restaurant business. The Cedar of Lebanon, the national symbol of their country of origin, stands side by side with signs advertising kebabs. Back in Europe, at Art Goldau, on Lake Zugersee, near Lake Lucerne. Here, an old Franciscan monastery, bought and restored by the Archdiocese of Central Europe, has become the main monastery and point of reference for all the Syriac people who have settled in the cantons of the Swiss Confederation. The Patriarch came in person to consecrate the church. The ceremony is followed by a procession to the Catholic parish, graciously lent for the occasion since the monastery's church was too small to hold such a large congregation. Gathering around a communal table, sharing typical ethnic foods, is a treasured ritual for the Syriac people.
I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In another Swiss church, a baptism celebrated according to the rigorous Syriac ritual welcomes Marcus Jakub Halef into the community. In Siebnen, in the canton of Schwitz, the president of the Association for Syro-Aramaic Culture commemorates the memory of the famous Archbishop Philoxenus Johannum Dolabani, who died in 1969. An orator, translator, poet, and author of more than 70 books, the Archbishop was a shining example for Syrian Christians of his generation and remains so for those who remember and revere him today. Our visit to the German diocese begins in Frankfurt on Main. Once part of the Central European diocese, this diocese has been independent since 1997 and is now one of the most important in Europe. Our first meeting with them takes place, naturally, in one of the many Syrian Orthodox churches. Living in Germany today are more than 55,000 Syrian Orthodox Arameans, most of whom are originally from Turabdin, with some 3,000 from Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. Forty-three parishes run 60 places of worship, 22 of which are newly built churches. The Church of St. Gabriel in Kirkart, with its fine architecture, its icons, and its frescoes, is famous as the most beautiful Syrian Orthodox Church in Europe. In the front row of St. Gabriel's congregation is a white-bearded senior citizen, whom we discover was parish priest here for 12 years. Later, we visit him in his home, where we find him intent on the work he enjoys most the careful, patient copying in beautiful calligraphy of theological and liturgical books. He then sees to their binding, following the ancient traditions of the old monasteries. A prolific author in his own right, he's dedicated almost his entire life to this work, along with his many duties as a priest. In Warburg, at the monastery of Moor Jacob of Zrug, the seat of the diocese, we meet the patriarchal vicar of Germany while he presides at a meeting of his seminarians. As in all the countries of the diaspora, Syriac Christians in Germany are represented by two basic entities, the Syrian Orthodox Church and the Lay Federation of Arameans. The federation was begun in 1985 by forming a first group of 10 Aramean cultural associations. There are now 40 of these groups. The Federation, independent of all political parties, represents the Aramean people in Germany and is charged with caring for the cultural, social, and political needs of the Syriac Aramean community. Among its main activities is the publication of a magazine entitled Mardutho de Suryoye, Aramean Culture, which provides its readers with news and information of interest to their particular sensibilities. They also promote and organize events which may be cultural, recreational, or have to do with community welfare. These events create the opportunity for the Aramean people to gather together and to strengthen the bonds of mutual understanding and solidarity in the spirit of their oldest, most cherished traditions. I'm 
Every now and then, there's a really special occasion, such as this consecration of a new church in Augsburg near Munich, performed by the patriarch, ever ready to come to the call of his flock wherever and whenever it needs him. Every new event of this kind is another milestone along the road this community is following through the modern world. In Holland, the Church of Our Lady in Amsterdam welcomes us to the Archdiocese of Central Europe. St. Johannes was the first Syrian Orthodox Church to be built in Holland. It looks more like a house than a church, but it has given birth to many others. St. Mary's, St. Jacob's, St. Kuriakos, and more Ignatius where we attended Sunday Mass, celebrated by the Archbishop. After Mass, we received a peremptory invitation to visit the Monastery of St. Ephraim near Hengelo, the seat of the Archbishop. The tranquility that pervades the monastery has a pleasing effect on the soul. The diocese has its own cemetery, where members of the community can now find eternal rest in their own land, as if they had returned to their homes in the mountains of Turabdin and the villages of Syria. The Federation of Syriac Christian Organizations of Holland is a cornerstone of the Aramean social fabric. It keeps abreast of the progress made by members, many of whom have become prominent citizens in their Dutch communities. Syro Arameans are active in import export and industry. as well as in textiles and clothing manufacturing. Some are artisans who have brought with them skills learned in their countries of origin. Others are in the restaurant and catering business, in which they have achieved significant success. One Syriac community member runs a driving school. And another is the only Syriac female business executive. She runs an insurance agency. 
However, the community's songs and music remain the same as those played in the villages of Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, and Iraq. And traditional rituals and terms of endearment are the same as those used in any Syriac church or family in its country of origin. Sweden. Syriac immigrants in Sweden are businessmen, restaurateurs, and artisans. In general, most of these people have done well in the diaspora. They have drawn on their long tradition in the fields of employment and commerce, successfully establishing themselves in their adopted societies. But they have not forgotten who they are and where they come from. Most of all, they have not forgotten the language of their forefathers. This professional photographer is talking in Syriac to a customer, a fellow Aramean, living proof of the community's pride in its cultural heritage. <laughs> The Syriac Christians in Sweden are represented in a number of different churches the Eastern Syriac Church, the Syriac branch of the Melkite Church, the Syriac Maronite Church, the Chaldean Church, the Syriac Catholic Church, the Protestant Churches, and of course, the Syrian Orthodox Church, where most of the faithful congregate. <laughs> The Syrian Orthodox Church is organized in two separate dioceses, the Diocese of Sweden, led by the Patriarchal Bishop Vicar, and the Diocese of Sweden and Scandinavia, under the direction of another Metropolitan Bishop. Altogether, the Syrian Orthodox Christians in Sweden total more than 40,000.
The Syrian Orthodox Church in Sweden has a very active, well-organized lay organization that is one of the most efficient Syriac federations in the world. The lay commitment is very strong. With the church's support, it promotes social and cultural activities that serve to unite the entire community and to stimulate exchange and collaboration between the different countries of the diaspora. By providing more in-depth understanding of the history of the Aramean people, it aims to ensure that the Syriac Christians scattered throughout the world will not lose their identity or their cultural heritage to the material affluence and religious agnosticism that increasingly characterize the wealthy societies which these Christians have joined. Sports-related activities are also used to promote the community's social and cultural well-being. The Syriac Federation's soccer team is among the top teams in Sweden's second division. Along with sporting activities, the Syriac Youth Federation, founded in 1992 and one of the initiators of SIEC, Syrian Aramean European Youth, is now one of the largest youth organizations in Sweden, with 30 member associations and almost 10,000 members. Its main aims are to give Syrian youth a platform to safeguard their cultural identity and background and help them integrate into the society of their host country without losing their traditional values. We're in the offices of the Syriac Federation in Sweden where we visit the staff of Bahro Suryoyo, the Syriac Aramean Light, an independent magazine founded in Sweden in 1979. This publication follows the most important Syriac Aramean activities in Sweden and in the rest of the world. Bahro Suryoyo comes out 11 times a year and contains news and information of all kinds, including articles dealing with history, culture, sports, politics, and economics. It's written in five languages, Swedish, English, Turkish, Arabic, and in Syriac Aramean. The magazine has around 1,500 subscribers, but its circulation among individuals, families, schools, libraries, and various institutions totals between 40 and 50,000. Bahro Suryoyo is the voice of the Syriac Aramean people scattered all over the world. The Syriac people in Sweden are mainly refugees from Turabdin, the region that suffered more persecutions and massacres than any other. At the Federation's headquarters, a painfully simple rendition of those events by a popular artist serves as a tragic reminder.
India deserves its own chapter, or rather Kerala, the southernmost tip of the subcontinent where the Syriac Christian community flourishes in numerous branches. According to local tradition, St. Thomas landed here in 52 AD, founding the first Christian community. In the first century AD, there was a considerable amount of trade between South India and the Roman Empire. Therefore, such an early arrival of Christianity in South India is perfectly plausible. At various later times, in the mid-fourth century and in the ninth century, there are records of the arrival of Syriac Christians from the Middle East. The first were 72 families from Edessa in 354 AD. Today, there are as many as eight different churches which are heirs to the Syriac tradition. One of the largest of these is the Syrian Orthodox Church of Malankara, Malankara being an older name for Kerala, with some two million faithful, having the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch as their supreme spiritual authority. The stories of St. Thomas, depicted in many of the churches dedicated to him, tell of his arrival in India, of his preaching, and of his martyrdom, which links the church of Malankara to the martyrs of all Christian churches. Syriac inscriptions often report details of important events in local history. It's important to emphasize that faith in Christ, passed down for 2,000 years from father to son, has not erased the host country's local traditions and customs. On the contrary, many have been absorbed and integrated into the church's rituals as spontaneous prayers and a sign of the people's true devotion.
St. Mary at Kothamangalam is the oldest church in Kerala. Following centuries of renovation and rebuilding, today's church bears almost no sign of the original 4th and 5th century building. All that remains is this stone inscribed with ancient Aramaic writing and the frescoes behind the main altar. Syriac origins, however, are clearly visible in this painting and in other details. This church has a congregation of 1,000 families and is considered the cathedral of the Diocese of Angamali. Angamali's 400,000 members make it the world's largest Syriac community. There are 625 parish churches in Kerala, grouped into 11 dioceses. This is the Church of St. Mary at Tiripunitra. This church, looking out over a river, is St. Mary's in Piravom. Tradition has it that it was founded by one of the three wise men, or more specifically, by the Black King when he returned here from Bethlehem after visiting the Christ Child. Originally, it was dedicated to the three kings, but since the Orthodox faith does not allow such unorthodox dedications, it was renamed the Church of St. Mary. Nevertheless, popular belief still insists on invoking the three kings.